In this section, I want to discuss the human microbiome and its role in health and disease. When we use the term human microbiome, what we're talking about is the community of organisms, more specifically microorganisms, that live on and in an individual. And of course, in this case, we're talking about humans. The human microbiome can consist of bacteria, archaea, viruses, um, and fungi, including things like yeasts. Um, for bacteria, we have hundreds of species that live on and in us. Uh, viruses most often are going to include bacteriophages and not necessarily pathogenic viruses, but altogether, this is a collection of organisms that we are associated with. Depending on your source, um, for example, the textbook for this class says that the ratio of microbial cells to human cells is 10 to 1, meaning if we have 1 trillion cells that make up the human body, um, these statistics would say that we have 10 trillion bacteria, archaea, fungi, etc. associated with us. More recently, um, and maybe a little bit more likely, uh, some of the stats I've seen are closer to two to one or even a one to one ratio, depending on the time of day, whether or not you've just used the restroom, whether you've taken a shower. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily matter whether it's 10 to one or two to one. But again, the idea is bare minimum for every cell you have, there is at least one microorganism hanging out with you. And so I always like to say, if you're feeling alone, remember you have billions and billions of friends that are depending on you to survive. In terms of the body, the GI tract has been found to be the most diverse, meaning the highest number of species of different microorganisms. But even within that, all individuals are different. My GI tract is going to be different from yours, going to be different from you know, a random member of the public on the street. However, when we look at humans, we do have this idea that there's what we call a core microbiome. With the core microbiome, what we mean is that these are species that are found in approximately 95% of individuals. So if we took a random survey of 100 people, 95 of them at least should have some similar species. And whatever species were shared among those 95 people, we would call the core microbiome. As part of your reflection for this section, I'd like you to think about and maybe propose an answer to the question, what are the implications of having a shared group of organisms like this? What is the relevance or importance of having a core microbiome? Other species uh, that are found maybe in fewer individuals, maybe more unique to who you are as an individual, that can sometimes be called the variable microbiome or the secondary microbiome. When considering both the core um, and the secondary microbiome, we may see that there is taxonomic diversity, meaning we have a number of different species. We have lots of different species that provides us that taxonomic diversity. But within that taxonomic diversity, we have functional redundancy, meaning we may have many different species that can all perform the same function. So again, as part of your reflection for this section, I'd like you to maybe speculate why having taxonomic diversity but functional redundancy could be important. When uh, we look at the human microbiome, and then this figure is, of course, from the textbook, many different areas of the human body have had the microbiome characterized. And we can classify different parts of the body as being sebaceous, uh, oily is, is kind of what we mean there. There are uh, lots of sebum that's being produced. 
We have moist areas, places that get sweaty, like the bottom of your feet. Um, and we have dry areas, for example, um, the buttocks, the forearm, uh, often your palms are, are dry, I guess unless you're very, very nervous or it's very, very hot. And what you can see is that in each of these different areas, the diversity of the microbiome is different. Now here, the microbiome, they're classifying only bacterial species. Again, there could be archaea, viruses, fungi associated with these different areas. But one of the easiest taxonomic groups to characterize are the bacteria. We have a very well-known marker. It's the 16S rRNA um, gene sequence that allows us to classify microorganisms down to most often the genus, but sometimes even the species level. So oftentimes when people are talking about the microbiome, they do mean only the bacteria, but remember the microbiome can contain other organisms as well. Each individual will have what we call the normal flora. That's the unique community that that individual has in a particular body site um, and overall um, as the individual themselves. What we see with the normal flora is that this is established starting right at birth, whether the child is born vaginally or via C-section, microbes begin colonizing right away during the first meal, the first exposure to air, the first breath microbes begin to colonize the body. As humans, we are the hosts. We provide a space for microbes to grow and inhabit. We provide many nutrients, um, complex carbohydrates, proteins, etc. And we can also provide some protection. We have areas in our body where maybe the immune system doesn't poke through very frequently. And when we talk about immunology in a couple of chapters, we'll talk about uh, where those sites are. So we can provide protection for microorganisms from our own immune system. Now, why would we do that? Well, we would do that because in return, the micro microbes, our microbiome, um, can provide metabolic functions. Very commonly uh, in humans and in other organisms, the microbes are actually able to break down and digest food that we are not able to. So for example, um, complex carbohydrates. Cows, let's think of cattle, right? Cows cannot digest cellulose. It's the microbes that live in the cow's intestines and in their stomach that allow the breakdown of those complex carbohydrates. Microbes can also provide things like short chain fatty acids, which provide an excellent source of energy for us. They can provide vitamins um, and other metabolites that we can use as well. Our normal flora also does provide some immune stimulation. Some colonization by the normal flora can also provide protection from pathogens. Uh, it's basically the idea of if there is no more space for a pathogen to colonize because a member of the normal flora has colonized, um, that can be very protective for the host. Of course, colonization of any environment is dependent on how that microbe exists in its environment and what conditions it needs. For example, in the gut, uh, there are very low oxygen levels, so we tend to see bacteria um, and other microorganisms that are anaerobic or facultative anaerobes. The pH of different environments is also different, so you can see different microorganisms that live in lower pH versus higher pH environments. Salt concentration can be very important, so salt-tolerant microorganisms like Staphylococcus tend to live on the skin where there's more salt, whereas salt intolerant uh, organisms like E. coli tend to live in the gut. 
And our normal flora is influenced by a number of different factors, including things like personal hygiene. How often do you bathe? What do you use to bathe? What type of soap? Do you use antimicrobial hand sanitizer? Um, all those things. Your diet, people who are vegetarian or vegan versus people who eat more animal products will have different microbiomes. How much water do you drink? Honestly, like that makes a big deal. Are you taking any medicines, especially antibiotics? Have you been exposed to any toxins, etc.? So every individual tends to have a different microbiome. Of course, a lot of us will share that same core, but those variable species can change. And as you might imagine, individuals that live in the same household tend to have similar microbiomes to one another than individuals in different households, especially if you eat together um, and use the same personal hygiene products. Disruption of the microbiome is also called dysbiosis, and this can have really significant consequences for the host. You can have things like loss of the metabolites produced by the microbiome. So maybe you lose um, the vitamin production or you lose the fatty acid production. Uh, if your members of your microbiome are missing or altered, that can allow colonization by pathogens. And of course, um, if you're missing some of those microbes that do things like digest complex carbohydrates, now you're no longer able to digest those complex carbohydrates. So what I want you to think about and what I want you to include in your reflection for this section is um, what are some factors that you can think of that could cause dysbiosis of the microbiome, disruption of our normal microflora. Dysbiosis can also be linked to various disease states, including inflammation, diabetes, obesity, among many, many others. And what we see here on the left-hand side of this image is what a healthy microbiome, theoretically in a cartoon, could look like. You have colonization in our um, kind of the mucousy layer, right in here, pathogens aren't really able to get in, maybe one or two could sneak through, um, but you have a lot of antimicrobial peptides, you have antibodies like IgA, which is a secretory antibody that helps protect um, things like your tears, your mucous membranes, of course, your GI tract, uh, various cytokines that are produced to help stimulate the immune response and prevent pathogen colonization. And now when we look over here on the right-hand side and we see a disruption or a dysbiosis of the microbiome, pathogens are more allowed to get in, um, you've got these cells that are now being infected, um, you have far less IgA that's being produced to protect, you have far fewer antimicrobial peptides. So dysbiosis of the microbiome is a really dangerous condition. And what we're looking at here is something you could include in your reflection, something that in, mm, inhibits maybe or interferes with the normal microbiome, um, antibiotic usage. And so what we're looking at here are uh, patients that were treated with different antibiotics. Um, uh, patient A was treated with uh, moxifloxacin, patient B with penicillin and clindamycin, patient C uh, with a double dose, and then patient D with amoxicillin. Uh, so you have the total microbiome and you can see how it changes. This is uh, before antibiotic therapy, during day three, day six, day 10, day 13, and then following uh, antibiotic therapy. And what you're looking at, each of these different bars represents a different microbial taxa. And in each patient, you see a really significant change following antibiotic usage. Then here the patients are classified and we have what type of antibiotic is being used. Um, so they're showing you it's a cell replication inhibitor for patient A, a protein synthesis inhibitor for patient B, um, and patients C and D are both receiving uh, cell envelope in synthesis inhibitors. And in this bottom panel, they're just trying to show um, which microbes are metabolically active. So this is just which microbes are present, this is which ones are working. 
um, based on transcript level. And again, you see significant differences. So what we're trying to illustrate here is that taking antibiotics for whatever reason, maybe they have a skin infection or maybe a respiratory infection, can have a really significant effect on the microbiome, even in the gut. So those of you who are thinking about going into clinical medicine, you really have to consider the implications of prescribing your patients broad spectrum or systemic antibiotics for infection. Of course, you don't want your patient to die of the infection. So, you know, thinking about what's the type of infection, what type of antibiotics can I give, what delivery methods should I give, those are all things that you'll have to think about in the clinical setting. Uh, microbiome can also be used for diagnostics and therapeutics. One of the major, I guess, types of dysbiosis that we see in patients um, is following antibiotic therapy, patients can get colonized with Clostridium difficile, sometimes called Clostridioides difficile. The taxonomy is sort of in flux with all of our different bacteria right now. So what we do in that case, when your patient has a resistant um, Clostridium difficile infection is called, scientifically, it's called a fecal microbiome transplant. Um, colloquially, we call it repopulation. And the idea is you have a healthy donor who supplies a fecal sample uh, that has the normal bacteria that should be found in the gut. And then those bacteria are then given to the patient who has the clostridium infection. Um, this can be done via suppository, via um, like a tablet or via a nasogastric tube um, so that the bacteria from the healthy donor are delivered directly to the site of infection, which would be the gut. And those new microbes that are coming in can colonize and push out the clostridium. Scientists are also trying to use the microbiome to diagnose various conditions. Um, alterations in the gut microbiome can predict things like the development of necrotizing enterocolitis, which is um, an infection in the colon that can, well, it's necrotizing, it leads to tissue death. We also know that proliferation of certain species in the gut can be a predisposition to something like colorectal cancer. And a lot of this is because these pathogens or these particular species that maybe don't belong in the gut, or at least don't belong in the gut at those high levels, cause an inflammatory response. And when we see that continued tissue damage by an inflammatory response and the continued repair and overgrowth, that eventually can lead to cells transforming uh, and becoming cancerous. We also talk about the idea that perhaps we can heal our microbiome or start our microbiome out on the right foot. So to heal the microbiome or balance the microbiome, many individuals will take what are called probiotics. Um, probiotics are generally cocktails or food products that contain organisms that are most often gram-positive bacteria um, and some yeasts. And again, the idea is that the consumption of these organisms that belong in the gut uh, will hopefully rebalance the gut or maintain gut health. Probiotics can be used and have been used to treat Clostridium difficile infections. Um, they can be used as protection against Salmonella or Helicobacter colonization. Some people use them as therapy for autoimmune conditions. Um, and they've even been shown to have some protection against caries or cavities. So those of you who are maybe interested in dental school, um, working in the dental field, perhaps probiotics might be something you'd recommend to your patients to help them prevent cavities. And prebiotics are supplements, generally like fibrous materials, that can be used to feed a healthy microbiome. So you're providing often those complex carbohydrates that microorganisms in your gut really, really would like. So some perspectives I'd like you to consider as you're thinking about the human microbiome. Can we predict disease by monitoring, uh, monitoring the microbiome? What changes in the microbiome are most important? Can disease be treated or prevented by restoring a healthy microbiome?
Can we use microbiome therapies to actually replace the use of antibiotics? And how do genetics, environment, and hygiene shape the microbiome? So as you progress through your careers, especially those of you interested um, in medical careers, you know, these are questions that you may have to answer. These are questions that you know, your patients may come to you with. I've heard that probiotics do X, Y, and Z. Doctor, do you think I should take probiotics? Which probiotics should I take? Um, are probiotics really good? Are they bad? Uh, if I use this soap, will it help me clear my acne? Because acne is often caused by uh, dysbiosis in the skin microbiome. So these are all things for you to think about, and especially those of you going into medicine, maybe questions that you have to answer from your patients in the future.